I want to begin with a question. To what degree is your life right now being shaped by our future final judgment? I want you to think about that. To what degree is your life right now, the things that you're doing, the things that you're thinking, the things that you're preoccupying yourself with, to what degree is your life being constrained, impacted, controlled in some way by your understanding of our future final judgment? As a sub-question, how much of your activity this past week was influenced in some way by your understanding that one day you will stand before your true master and you will give an account for what you've thought, for what you've said, every idle word, for what you've done. How often have you considered that His divine acts might be laid to your tree this week. If you've been contemplating the coming judgment this week, are you weird? Bit of an oddball? Are you spiritually immature? I mean, after all, Christians aren't supposed to live in fear, right? Or are you surprisingly wise? Today, my desire is for you to see future final judgment mattered to Jesus. And so, it should matter to you as well. Future final judgment. In some sense, it was everything to Jesus. And so likewise, it should be to His disciples as well. I remember an experience at Shoe Carnival when I was nearing junior high. I'm not sure to what degree you can see the clarity of that picture, but it's a picture of their cash-grabbing machine. Oh, how fun Shoe Carnival used to be. As I entered that machine as a young boy, my life was shaped by eschatology of sorts. Here's what I mean by that. I knew I only had 30 seconds to grab as much cash as I could. I knew that I only got to keep and place towards my shoe purchase the cash that I was able to grab and then insert into a very small plastic compartment in front of me. As I've gotten older, I realize it was small for a purpose. I knew there was no time for delay. There was no room in the cash machine for distraction. A future reality. That's what I mean when I say eschatology. Governed my activity. Similarly, I recall with fondness the first two years of married life. Karen and I lived on the road and we traveled as college recruiters, staying nightly in various hotels in whatever part of the country we happened to be in at that time. We tried to stay as much as we could in choice hotels. Choice hotels, if you're watching, you can feel free to send me some sort of gift. We found them to be fairly clean, usually safe, and definitely within my per diem or price range. As we lived out of our suitcases, our lives were shaped by an eschatology of sorts. Here's what I mean. We knew that whatever room we entered and whatever condition we found that room in, for that night, it was only our temporary home. Therefore, believe it or not, we never remodeled. We never repainted. And a few times, the rooms needed it. 
We never recarpeted a room that we stayed in. Nor, just so you know, I have some measure of integrity, we took no hand towels, bed linens, or TV remotes. You see, we knew we were staying for a limited time. Any money spent out of our own pockets to improve the state of the room would have been a complete and utter waste. Therefore, we spent nothing on such improvements. A future eschatology, our checking out of the hotel room, governed our present activities. In Luke 12, 1 through 13, 9, Luke desires for our activity to be shaped by our eschatology. And if you're not familiar with that word, a fancy word, our understanding of final things, the reality of a future and final judgment. Luke desires that our words, thoughts, and actions today be influenced by our understanding of the future final judgment Jesus emphasized in His earthly teaching and preaching ministry. So this morning, here's my big idea. Future final judgment mattered to Jesus. And so, young person watching at home, yes you, wake up on the couch, look this way. And so, it it must, if you're a disciple of Jesus, matter to you. It must. And I want you to first of all notice with me how much the future final judgment dominated Jesus' teaching and preaching leading up to our text. Alright, so here's what we're going to do. Hope you got your Bible open. Our text today, chapter 13, verses 1-9. through nine. But quickly, I want to show you. So, so you got to have your Bible open. You need to look. You're the jury. I'm seeking to persuade you, and here's my case, leading up to our text, starting in chapter 12, verse 1, all the way to our culminating text today, Jesus has been building a theme of future final judgment. It dominates his teaching and preaching leading up to our text. If you look with me at chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, Jesus warned his disciples secret things one day will be revealed. Look what he said in verse 1 Beware! And then in verse 2, everything covered will be revealed. And the question that we ought to be asking is when will that happen? And the ultimate answer is the great day of judgment. Again in verse 2, everything hidden will be made known. We might say, well, 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 when exactly does that happen? And Jesus is planting the seeds that today will sprout and bear fruit. It will certainly happen on the future and final judgment. Verse 3, everything whispered, set in the dark, will be shouted or proclaimed in the light from the rooftop. Jesus is pointing our minds toward the reality of future eschatological final judgment before God at the end of the age. Now that's just verses 1 through 3. In chapter 12, verses 4 through 12, Jesus utilizes the reality of future final judgment in his warning to fear God, not man. I want you to see how he utilizes the warning of future and final judgment to build his sermon. He reminded his listeners of the coming judgment by referring to his father's, and I'm looking at verse 5, authority to cast into hell. He warned his audience of the coming judgment by warning them that he, the Son of Man, would one day either acknowledge or deny them in the presence of God and before His holy angels. Again, what's He pointing us to consider? Future, final, judgment. 
he cautioned the crowd against blaspheming or speaking evil of the Holy Spirit in light of the reality that such blasphemy will not be forgiven, verse 10, on that eschatological day. In the mind of Jesus, the reality of who God is and the reality of judgment that awaits us ought impact our daily decision of who we choose to fear or who we seek to please. So Jesus spoke of the final judgment in verses 1 through 3, and as well as in verses 4 through 12, but as if that weren't enough. Jesus continued to direct his audience to consider their future and final judgment in verses 13 through 21. In verse 13 through 21, Jesus, he's responding to a man's inquiry concerning his inheritance that he believes he deserves. And Jesus responds by warning of the danger of covetousness and greed. But he also warns, now, now pay attention to how he keeps pointing us to this thought. He also warned of the reality that this night, we like the rich fool in verse 19, could be summoned to give an account of ourselves before God. This very night. Did that enter your mind at all yesterday? Final judgment dominated Jesus' teaching and preaching in verses 1 through 3, in verses 4 through 12, in verses 13 through 21. Watch now, verse 22 through 40. In verse 22 through 40, Jesus called his disciples to fear God, not wealth. Remember that? We had several sermons on that. Yet, even as Jesus unpacked how his disciples should focus on God and his provision and allow this to fuel their kingdom generosity, he did so in light of the eschaton, in light of the final judgment. Remember in verse 36, he instructed them to, and I quote, be like men who are waiting for their master to come home. In other words, return. And in verse 40, after warning them how the master responds to unfaithful servants, he concludes, you, child of God, must also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect. Their faithfulness in fearing God, not wealth, was their means of being ready for Christ's return. Now, I know, some of you might be thinking, surely, Jesus can't keep this up. Final judgment has dominated his teaching thus far. We saw it in verse 1 through 3. We saw it again in verse 4 through 12. We saw it in verses 13 through 21. And verses 22 through 40. Surely he'll shift his focus at some point, right? Wrong. In verse 41 through 48, Jesus responded to Peter's request. Remember what Peter asked? Jesus, can you clarify exactly who you're talking to right now? Is it us? Is it them? Who? Jesus responded to Peter, warning that everyone needed to be prepared for the return of the Master, for their final future judgment. In verse 48, Jesus said, and boy, for any of us, who have had the grace of being a Christian for any measure of time, let this, let this weight impact you. Everyone to whom much was given of him, much will be required. And, and, and towards what day, moment, event is Jesus pointing our attention to? Again, our future, final judgment. Are you detecting a pattern yet? Do we have a few Captain Obviouses in the room? How about at home? 
He spoke of future judgment, verses 1 through 3, verses 4 through 12, verses 13 through 21, verses 22 through 40, verses 41 through 48, and there's just a few verses to go till we get to our text. So let's take a wild guess. How many of you think by way of raised hands that he just might remain focused on this in verses 49 through 59? You think maybe? Excellent. You're very perceptive. Let's see if you're right. Verses 49 through 59. Jesus. Again, called for the, decide, the crowds to make a decision concerning who he is in light of the signs he had given them. But I want you to pay close attention. If you have your Bible open to verses 58 and 59, Jesus compared his crowd to a debtor that's about to be taken to court. And through this analogy, Jesus was actually declaring that they had better come to a decision quickly concerning who he was before their future final judgment day arrived. Where, unless things changed, they would stand before God unprepared. And I quote, would never get out until they had paid the very last penny. Future final judgment mattered to Jesus. And so, it should matter to you. It should impact the way that you walk. The way that you talk. The priorities that you make and activities you avoid. And we have seen this thus far in Jesus' words leading up to our text. Keep in mind that according to Scripture, words proceed from the heart. It's because the future matters so much to Jesus that it dominates His teaching and preaching. We'll see again today as the future final judgment dominates our text. Chapter 13, verses 1-9. through We have to pause here for a minute. We've got to work this into our lives. We've got to press this into some nitty-gritty details. How then should we now live? Moms, were you living in light of the future final judgment this past week? Did it ever enter into your mind that on that particular day you could be called that very night to stand before your God and give an account of your stewardship of your home? Did your future final judgment work its way into your priorities? Did it create within you a sense of urgency for doing what was right, not necessarily what was convenient? Or was there a certain carelessness that permeated your activity, your spirit? Uh, Was there an aroma surrounding you? It's as if you were guaranteed the next thousand days. How about you, dads? Would Christ have caught us leading our families in worship around the dinner table? Would He have found us serving our neighbor or employer and serving them well so as to help open evangelistic doors and create gospel witnessing opportunities? Would we have ever been caught had the thief come in the night? Would we ever have been caught on our knees beside our beds, praying for the Father to quicken the hearts of our children or soften the heart of that growing teen. What I'm suggesting is this. If the future final judgment lingered in the mind of Jesus and constrained His actions, it should also linger in the minds of His disciples as well. Senior saint, I entreat you 
as a father or mother, have you concerned yourself at all with what gifts you'll have to offer him? Should he return today? Or the coronavirus catch you and call you home? Has this thought... I mean, I'm not trying to be rude here, but if you're a senior saint, hello, you're on the final lap. Has this thought quickened your gait, spiritually speaking? Has it strengthened your steps? Have you said the things that you need to say? Have you said them again? Have you taken the spiritual actions that you default to tomorrow? There may be no tomorrow. Young person, whether you're in elementary, whether you just graduated with the world's worst senior year, have you concerned yourself at all lately with the introspective thought with what gifts will you present yourself to him should he return today or call you home? I want you to think for a minute. How would he receive your schoolwork you've just completed? How would he grade your efforts and your attitudes. For I, for I speak to you in love, if you are a young person, your schoolwork may be all that you have to give. Would you have been found faithful in honoring and obeying your parents? Brothers and sisters, what I'm trying to get at ever so clumsily is that I don't believe a single one of us, I don't believe a single one of us thinks as oft as he or she ought concerning our future final judgment. Remember the words of Paul. This shaped everything he did or said. We all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what he is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 and 10. Future final judgment mattered to Jesus, and so it should matter to us as well. Now, having analyzed how much the future dominates Jesus' teaching and preaching leading up to our text, let's now consider, secondly, how the future final judgment permeates our text today. Luke 13, we're going to specifically be looking at verses 1 through 5. So secondly, consider with me how much the future final judgment permeates Jesus' teaching and preaching within our text. Not just leading up to, but now within our text. Keep in mind the big picture. All you kids that are here in the auditorium, I want you to say this with me. If the future final judgment mattered to Jesus, it should also matter to me. All right, let's try that. If the future final judgment mattered to Jesus, it should also matter to me. Now, kids at home, who sit on the couch in silence, I'm talking to you now, join with all of us in this auditorium as we say together, if the future final judgment mattered to Jesus, it should also matter to me. Let's try it together. If the future final judgment mattered to Jesus, it should also matter to me. Now let's dive into today's text. 
Follow along with me as I look at verse 1. There were some present at that very time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now watch what's happening. Some people informed Jesus about a recent tragedy. And this is horrific. Some Galileans, remember Galileans, that's Jesus' people, right? Some Galileans had traveled to Jerusalem to offer up their sacrifices. They were devout Jews. And they were slaughtered by Pilate while in Jerusalem for sacrifice. But if you pay close attention to our text, Pilate slaughters them evidently within the temple grounds while they're in the very act of sacrificing. This is outrageous, right? If you're a Jew, outrageous. Horrific for sure. But I want you to put your thinking caps on. What are they wanting Jesus to do with this info? Are they, because remember, he's been tightening the screws. Are they seeking to redirect his attention? It's getting a little hot for them. They want him to get a little bit off of his focus on them and their need to repent. Are they seeking to spark a retaliation? Jesus, you are the king. Justice must happen now. Perhaps. Do they merely want his personal commentary? Like we would turn to fill in the blank with your favorite radio or TV commentator. And I would say to that, certainly at the least. Jesus answers in verse 2. And we have to keep in mind, as Jesus answers in verse 2, how Jesus is able to discern the thoughts of his audience. And he's always directing his teaching to address their thoughts. Remember, he's done this already back in Luke 5.22 when he healed the paralyzed man. Telling him that his sins were forgiven. He read the Pharisees' minds as they thought to themselves, who can forgive sins but God alone? And he, he directed his words to their thoughts, though they were unsaid. He did this also in Luke eleven seventeen, 17, when he had cast a demon out of a mute man. Jesus knew the Pharisees were thinking that his power derived from Beelzebul, Satan. And in light of that, Jesus directed his teaching to address their thoughts, though they were unsaid. In light of this, Jesus is likely in his answer here speaking to their thoughts on Pilate's savagery. So let's look carefully at the answer in verse 2. He answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered in this way? Now pay close attention. Particularly those with uh, fresh, active minds concerning the presence of evil and suffering under God's sovereign care. It is a common misperception to think that a specific tragedy or misfortunate event is always a direct judgment of God upon a person because of their sin. All right, I need to circle back and say that again because I want you to catch it. It is a common misperception to think that a specific tragedy or misfortunate event is always a direct judgment of God upon you because of your personal sin. Right? You forgot to put your tithe in the mail. And then your tire goes flat. And you're thinking, oh no! He caught me! Personal misfortune or tragedy is not always a direct result of one's personal sin. I knew I should have kissed my wife goodnight. And that's why the Colts lost. No, the Colts just stink. Right? It's not necessarily a personal, direct result of your sin. Scripture records, interestingly, that people at various times and cultures have struggled with this false idea. Eliphaz, Job's friend, says so much to Job after disaster struck Job's home in Job 4.7, when he asked Job, who that was innocent ever perished? 
See, Elevas thought that when tragedy strikes, it's because you've sinned. Jesus' disciples even made this false assumption. Do you recall John 9, 1 and 2, when they confronted the man who was born blind? Jesus, knowing their thoughts, asked them, which man sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus' answer was, neither. And as we read in the narrative of Acts, and this shows just how common the misperception is, and it's amongst all peoples and cultures. Scripture records for us when Paul is shipwrecked on the island of Malta. The natives conclude disaster is directly connected to personal sin when a poisonous snake bites Paul on his hand. And according to Acts 8, 28, 4, they conclude, and I quote, no doubt this man is a murderer, end quote. And if you and I were completely honest, we have wrestled with similar thoughts concerning ourselves, our friends, and tragedies that strike in foreign or domestic lands. Here's what I want you to see, though, as we move into verse 3. I want you to see this. Pay close attention to this. Jesus' focus concerning the future final judgment controls his response. Jesus' focus concerning the future and final judgment controls how he answers their inquiry. Verse 3. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Okay, this is unexpected. Now, I want you to really catch this, so lean in. Lean in. Jesus offers no words of condolence or sympathy. Instead, Jesus punches them in the nose with reference to their correct thinking, incorrect thinking. Jesus is saying succinctly, death is not always a direct result of someone's particular sin against God. No, in fact, death is the just reward for all men because all have sinned. I want you to catch this. In Jesus' mind and teaching, the tragic deaths of others should remind us of our future appointment with death and the judgment that follows perishing for those who are outside Christ. You have to remember this crowd has not yet repented of their sin. They've not yet turned to faith in Christ as God's Messiah. Had they done this, they wouldn't be being addressed as part of the crowd, but rather as part of His disciples. I don't know if you are aware, but this is the front cover of today's New York Times. U.S. deaths near 100,000 with reference to the coronavirus. An incalculable loss. And then listed out are over a thousand names of men and women who have died in the past few months during this pandemic. Now friend, I want you to imagine for a moment how folks would respond if a pastor were to talk like this today. Imagine if on the evening news a pastor were to be interviewed about this article and he responded, no words of sympathy, no politically correct expressions of how horrific the tragedy is. Imagine if a pastor responded in the mainstream media and looked in the camera and said, not with anger, but with blood earnestness and compassion, and maybe even a tear in his eye and a crack in his throat, I tell you, except you repent, you too will likewise perish. What would, what would we say concerning such a man? Insensitive? For sure. Calloused? 
Yep. Crazy? Probably. Offensive and hateful? Etc. In fact, I'd go so far as to say most Christians would respond in outrage, decrying such a man. Yet this is exactly what Jesus did. Would you dare accuse Jesus of being unloving? Would you dare call Jesus insensitive, calloused, crazy, offensive, hateful? Perhaps the church, as well as our culture, has allowed the true understanding of love to be hijacked to the point where what is truly loving isn't even recognizable to most of us today. In case you doubt me, think to yourself, when was the last time I told anyone they needed to repent? And yet, there are many who you know who need to be told just that. People that we say we truly love. The future final judgment mattered to Jesus. Does it matter to us as well? But wait, Jesus isn't done answering. Notice how Jesus repeats his future final judgment focus in verses 4 and 5. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, Jesus again knows their thoughts. He's bringing up a different tragedy. This tragedy is not an act of tyranny, but rather what you might call a freak accident. The tower or wall adjacent to the Pool of Siloam in Jerusalem collapsed, killing 18. And potentially, amongst these 18 were men, women, and even a child or two. This tragedy affected Judeans, not Galileans like Pilate's atrocity? Did this freak accident befall them because of some sin they had committed? Jesus answers a resounding no. This side of Eden, hear me, we live in a world where freak accidents happen and innocent people suffer. Yet again, Jesus says we should not be thinking about their sin In Jesus' mind, we should be thinking about our sin and our souls and our future appointment with death and the final judgment that will follow. Are we ready? Will we be able to stand before God on that day? This crowd wasn't ready, for they had not yet repented and committed themselves to following Christ. Jesus in love, commands them to repent. He commands them to repent. We've seen how the future dominated Jesus' teaching leading up to our text. We've seen how the future dominated Jesus' teaching within our text, verses 1-5. through Finally, let's consider how the future should impact our lives in accordance with our text. How should the future dominate my life in accordance with our text? Luke 13, 6 through 9. Jesus concludes his sermon with a parable or story. Listen closely as I read. And he told this parable A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Now, pause. You don't seek fruit on a fig tree until the time of maturation where it's reasonable to expect such fruit. We must suppose that that time has been reached. So Jesus said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now, wow, what patience. I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree. Every year I come, I find none. Cut it down. 
Why should it use up our ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, one more year, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good, but if not, ah, you can cut it down. Now, keep in mind, stories about vineyards are very common in ancient Israel because many people had vineyards or worked in one or walked by one. The master in this story is extremely patient with the fig tree. I mean, he has given it, after its maturation, three years to produce fruit. Some of you in your raised garden beds would not put up with a plant that for three years wouldn't bear any fruit. And the master recognizes that it's now costing him further. It's taking up space. It's absorbing minerals. It's producing nothing. It needs to be removed. Yet the servant, however, holds out hope that the fig tree is still salvageable. And so he proposes a new plan. He'll dig around it. He'll put manure or fertilizer on it. Evidently, this was an extreme measure. He had not taken it up to this point. In essence, the servant appeals, just give it one more year. If it doesn't produce fruit after these measures, I will cut it down. Now, there is a certain vagueness to Jesus' parable. On one hand, is the fig tree representative of each individual listening to him? Or does this speak to the entire nation of Israel? And we have to wrestle with that. Regardless, Jesus is clearly comparing his audience with the fig tree in this story. And he's calling for them to repent. Or, as we've seen earlier in Luke's Gospel, He's calling them to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Think of John the Baptist preaching in Luke 3.8. In Jesus' mind, time is of the essence in this matter. Now listen to this. God has already given them three years. Possibly a reference to the timing of John and Jesus preaching and teaching. Up to this point, they've borne no fruit. Just as John the Baptist warned prior to Jesus, and I'm quoting now Luke 3, 9, every tree therefore that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Jesus is warning them. Now watch this. Watch this. Catch this. Don't miss it. Jesus is saying through this story, your judgment day is coming. God has been so extremely merciful to not cut you down as of yet. But take heed. <clears throat> that day is quickly approaching. The axe is already being laid to the root of the tree. Turn to God today. Follow Him right now before it's everlastingly too late. Future final judgment mattered to Jesus, and so it should matter to you as well. Hear me, beloved, gathered in our auditorium. Listen carefully, those watching our live stream. Have you truly repented of your sin and committed your life to following God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ? Listen carefully, teenager. I believe you have so much in common with this crowd. You have grown up with a close exposure to the gospel. But yet, you failed to make Christ your own. You ought marvel today that God has not yet cut you down. How long will He tolerate your unwillingness to bear Him fruit? Oh, if we only had eyes to see the portrait that Jonathan Edwards painted in his famous sermon that was part of the Second Great Awakening. You and I are sinners in the hands of a righteously angry God. 
What keeps you from repentance today? Turn to Jesus now before it's everlastingly too late. God's Spirit will not always strive with man. How many more years will He grant you to respond to His grace? You eat His bread. You breathe His air. You live on His earth. How long will He turn a blind eye to your unfruitfulness? Christ can make you fruitful. Turn to Christ while you still may. I wonder if there's someone that we might call in church speak a seeker. Whether you're here or whether you've joined us on our live stream, maybe you're listening on the radio. And you too have much in common with this crowd that Jesus is addressing. You've been watching our services online now for weeks. You've been listening to sermons on the radio each Sunday. And this is not your first exposure to the Gospel of Jesus Christ. For how many years now has the Master inspected the unfruitfulness of your branches? Think of all the times and moments where He had every right to take your life. He planted you. He watered you. He provided for you necessary sun and shade. Yet you have taken up room in His vineyard. It is right for Him to expect fruit, your love, your devotion. Perhaps the Godhead in the inter-Trinitarian council has spoken. Cut Him down. Why should He use up our ground? Only then to counter. Let Him alone this year also. And if He bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, cut Him down. Oh, friend, may fear strike your soul. I mean, friend, this should cause you to lay awake at night how much of your final year remains. This very night, your soul could be required of you. Yield yourself today to the Lordship of the crucified and risen Savior, Jesus Christ, before it's everlastingly too late. Brothers and sisters, as I close this message, let me remind you of what you have just witnessed. You have just witnessed the ultimate evangelist, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You have seen how the future and final judgment dominated what He did, what He said, how He said it, to whom He said it. So let's renew our commitment to imitate Him. God grant us more of His love, real love, to cause us to care enough to call those around us to repent. Future final judgment mattered to Jesus. May the Spirit of God help it matter to us as well. Let's pray. Father, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Father, forgive us for departing from the simplicity of the call to repent. Creation bears witness to your majesty, your law, has been written upon our hearts. Our consciences are active to condemn us. There is a world around us that, that suppresses this truth. They suppress it. They suppress it with false religion. They suppress it with entertainments. They suppress it with distractions. But in the quietness of the moment when they lay still in bed at night, when they are confronted face to face with their fleeting, fragile life, there is a measure of terror, for it is a fearful thing to stand before a holy God. 
But Father, not everyone has heard the good news. Not everyone knows that you and your love sent your son. Not everyone knows that your son came and died for his people. Not everyone knows that you poured out your wrath on your son so that all who would turn, all who would believe, all who would yield to him as Lord would be forgiven, granted the Spirit, and part of his future heaven and earth. Not everyone knows. And so, Father, I pray that with a renewed vigor, with, with real love, not, not with anger, not with hostility, not with frustration, but with true compassion, You would grip our hearts to reach out to those around us. May we be a church that calls people to repent. For when we do, we are standing firm with our Lord and Savior. For the Spirit and the Bride say, come. And whosoever is willing, let him come and take the water of life freely. I pray as we prepare now for our baptism that we would see more brought in as we are seeing today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.